Lord, we're here to sing it. We're here to speak it. We're here to proclaim it. We're here to announce it. And we love you, Lord. Because you have first loved us. And Lord, we're here just as a dedication of our life to faithfully walk with you day in and day out. To honor you with the way we live our lives. To learn more and more about you and to worship you together. And we do that today. It's our great honor to come into your presence today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. You can be seated. Well, I, you know, we were uh, announcing, well, first of all, uh, let me welcome everybody. My name is Carl. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm the lead pastor here at Lakes. And, um, you know, we had been announcing over the past month, this was Karen's brainstorm. Actually, I think God's brain, 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 brainstorm, easy for me to say. It was his heart storm. It was a heart storm. There you go. I like that. Uh, to call the Jesus people together. And uh, where are my Jesus people? All right. That was fairly weak, guys. I was just going to brag about you guys, and I get, okay, where are my Jesus people? All right, all right. All right. Amen. And those of us uh, especially got saved in the 70s and the 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and the, this movement, the revival, for you young folks, uh, it's coming again, so get ready, but... Um, it was a special time, and we all kind of just got swept up and born again and transformed, and our lives changed. And so we had this gathering. We just called everybody together by the Jesus people. So I thought 15 might come. Karen thought 20. We had 35 of you guys show up, and we were so excited. And I'm telling you, it's just a starting. I'm warning you. I'm going to cut them loose here in this church. And it's very exciting times to come. Let me grab my pulpit real quick here. Oops. We are in the process of studying the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. We're going to continue with that series this morning. So I hope you'll open your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelation. Today we are studying the letter to the church. And most of us would pronounce this Thyatira, but I've, I was working on this week, because you know, if you can go to Blue Letter Bible and uh, click on this a little, a little uh, speaker there that uh, tells you how to pronounce things in the Greek, if I get this right, the pr uh, correct pronunciation is uh, Thautira. All right, would you say it with me? Thautira. And the only way I could try to remember is like Sal, Thou. Thautira is apparently how you pronounce that town. And if you look on your map there, you can see it's one of the seven ch uh, churches. We're right in the middle church right now. It started at Ephesus, and then Smyrna, and Pergamum, and now Thautira. And uh, let's pray. Lord, I just want to pray that as we speak today and study your word, as we delve into your word, that you would open it up to us, Lord. Open our eyes, open our understanding that we might behold the beauty in your word today. Speak to us today, Jesus. Amen. It was, um, this town was the smallest and the most insignificant of all of the other seven cities that a letter was written to. It's, uh, one commentator said it was the smallest city and it got the longest letter. This was the, by far the longest letter to any of the churches. It was located in a large, broad valley. By the way, this is on the back side of your notes. Did you find that yet? Um, this is, it was located in a large, broad valley between Pergamum and Sardis, about 40 miles uh, between each of those towns. It was conquered and reconquered many times because there were no natural defenses. Because it was in this valley, alongside of a river, easy access, and one uh, um, nation after another would uh, conquer this small, small, poor, small town. It boasted a temple to Apollos, the sun god. That was the primary thing. You remember that each of these cities tended to have one god that was dedicated to. There was, we saw that uh, in the past letters that we studied. It was mostly known as a, a military outpost. It was a center for the dyeing of fabric, especially purple, which is, was one of the most highly prized fabrics of that day. 
And it was also manu- known for manufacturing a special kind of fine brass and bronze, and that's going to be significant as we look into this letter in just a few minutes. Uh, trade, uh, trades were dominated by guilds. Now, the closest thing uh, I can relate that to would be something like a very strong union that uh, would hold power over these different things. So in other words, if you were a part of this fabric dyeing process and you wanted to be involved in the commerce of it or the creating of fine bronze and brass, then you would need to belong to this union in order to sell. And it was very strict and uh, overpowering for those who were there. And the, this often required participation in pagan festivals such as feasts and prostitution to incite the gods for favor. In other words, let's say you were selling purple and you, you, they were telling you, you have to be a part of this guild if you're going to sell purple. And a part of that being in the guild is you have to be involved in this, this idol worship. And that presented a great problem for the Christians, of course, that were there. The meaning of the word uh, Valterra is a graveyard, which is, you're gonna, again, that will also have some significance as we study this letter. So let's read these verses. First of all, it's Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. I want to remind you that Jesus was telling this to John, and he told him to write these things down. They were delivered to all of the churches and read aloud in the churches. Verse 18, and to the angel, or the pastor it would be, of the church of Thalterah, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who committed adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one according to your works. Now to you, I say, and to the rest of Thalterra, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I'll give him power over the nations." He shall rule them with a rod of iron and shall dash to pieces like the potter's vessel as I also have received from my father. And I give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, let's go back and roll up our sleeves here and see what the Lord might want to say to us. Again, I want to remind you, this was a letter written to the church right? This, you know, oftentimes we tend to look out and think about these horrible, wicked people that really need to hear the word of God. This was a letter of exhortation. The, in fact, all seven of these were lit, written to the churches. They were written to believers who were walking with Christ, who knew Jesus, who had lived his life for them, for him. Okay, let's go back and look at the description of Jesus as we've been saying. In each one of the letters, there's a description of Christ that's given that are all different that really apply to the the individual cities. First of all, number one, and this is a film link, I hope you'll take out your notes and fill in the blank. If you would, it's one of the best ways to learn. These things says the Son of God. Jesus identifies himself in this particular place as the Son of God. It's interesting that Throughout the entire book of Revelation that is all about Jesus and his returning, this is the only time the phrase the Son of God is used. It's quite interesting. Also, I think that this is especially important because of this temple. Can you imagine? This is a small town. 
And most of the people there were, were worshiping this god Apollos, who's the sun god. So I think it was very important that Jesus just established it. Now, I am, this, is, this letter is from the son of God, the only God, the one true God. Let's make no mistake about that. And he describes himself, number two, who has eyes like flames of fire is the fill in the blank. Eyes like flames of fire. Now, the commentators that I read and studied about this said that most of them felt like what this probably really representative is, if you can imagine this a majestic being with lasers coming out of his eyes. And the key to the lasers is he sees everything. It penetrates everything. The words flames of fire represents that. It sees everything. In fact, in verse 23, it says, I am he who searches the hearts and minds. So in his description, Jesus is saying, I'm the son of God, and I know everything, I see everything. Nothing is hidden from my view. You know, fire has a way of revealing things that are hidden oftentimes. Burns off the the dross. Number three, he also describes himself as one who has feet like fine brass. And there's a lot of different uh, ideas and thoughts of what this meant. I'll tell you what, I think it probably means this is a city, remember, that was known for this one specific Nowhere else in the world, one specific kind of fine brass that was refined right there. And to me, this paints a picture is, I'm the son of God, I see everything, and I walk throughout the city all the time. I'm here in the city walking and living. I know exactly what is going on everywhere, and especially in your church. And then like all the other, uh, or most of the other letters, there's, a, there's words of commendation. Jesus acknowledges, here's some things that your church has been really good at. Now, how did these churches come about? This church is one of many that Paul planted in his, on his second missionary journey as he was traveling around the known world and, and came through it. Ephesus, another, of course. We're not sure about some of the others, but there's a good, uh, good thought that Paul probably planted many of these. And Paul, obviously, he instructed these churches. He left leadership there to tell them how they're supposed to be living their lives. He instructed and taught. And, of course, many of the epistles are words or letters that Paul wrote to encourage them. So here's what Jesus says about this church. Verse number four, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith is the second fill in the blank, and your patience. No, I don't know about you, but... I think for most Christ followers, if Jesus came and said, I, these are the things that I see in your life and you're doing them well, I would feel pretty good about like, I think I'm doing great here as a Christ follower. And he says to them, number five, he says, as for your works, the last are more than the first. In other words, Jesus is saying, I see this church. I see that as you have gone along and matured and time goes by and it is thought that when this letter was written that this church was about 40 years old. If you plug in the the numbers or when Paul came through and when this letter was written, that this church had been around for about 40 years. That's quite a, a length of time to be there. And Jesus is saying, what you're doing now in the community as an outflow of your spiritual lives, you're doing more than you did when you first started. And he's commending he commending him for that. But one of the things we see in this letter, as we've just read it, is we're going to study an increase of spiritual activity and even works does not always equate to spiritual maturity. Just because we're really, really busy doesn't mean we're real spiritual, is what, if I can put that in my own words. Now, works are a good thing. In fact, there's several times in this letter, he is encouraging them to do the the good works, but that does not always relate to spiritual maturity. Number six, I want to do a little um, correlation to the church at Ephesus, which was the first letter that we read, and I happened to preach on that one. The church of Ephesus did not tolerate evil. In fact, it said in their commendations, you don't, you don't tolerate evil in your midst. But they had lost their love. So the fill in the blanks are, you did not tolerate evil, but you lost your love. The church at Thyatira was increasing in love, but they tolerated evil. And that was the thing that he had against them. I'm going to look back at Ephesians chapter 4. This was one of the letters that Paul wrote to the church. And kind of talk a little bit about Paul's description about spiritual maturity. And starting in verse 11, Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 4. He gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. 
He put these offices in the church. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, that's he's speaking of the church, and to a measure of fullness, of uh, a stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftedness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. Now in this, the the writer here, Paul, was saying here is what spiritual maturity is involved with. It's not only doing religious things, but it's also responding in love and speaking, the last verse there, speaking truthfully, holding up the truth of God's word, but in love. That's what a picture of spiritual maturity really is. In, in other words, what to this church, he was really saying, I love your love, but I hate your tolerance. Your tolerance for evil. That you're allowing these horrible things in your midst, in the church, and saying nothing about it. So that's just the correction there. You know, we all are, as we read through the scriptures and we study the scripture, there is this, this beautiful balance. In fact, I'm going to ask my lovely assistant, my wife Karen, in case you were wondering who that is, to come and bring me a little prop I want to show you to kind of illustrate this idea. You can see on there, we have, I have this line on your notes there, acts of love and speaking truth. Both of these things are, are commanded and commended in the scripture. That we're supposed to love. Jesus said, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but also love your neighbor as yourself. At the same time, stand for righteousness. Speak for righteousness. Did you get lost in there, honey? (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) You know, Carl. (laughs) You know, Carl. Yes. What? I couldn't find love and truth. Until I started following Jesus. Amen. That's right. And thank you. Because he's the source of both, right? He's the sport, source, sus, sus, wow. the source of truth. And he is the source of love. Now, you see that line there. And I have love on one side, truth on the other. I want you to think about your life and who you are. And I want you to put a little fulcrum point. Where you, do you lean more towards love? Or do you lean more towards a proclaimer of truth? Now, the reason why I brought this out is because uh, these are, they almost seem opposite, and yet they are tied very closely together. We're supposed to love the people of this world. We're supposed to love one another, right? But we're also supposed to stand up for what is right and truthful. And it's sometimes difficult to do both. Now, we have a tendency, most of us are not in perfect balance. Anybody put yourself directly in the middle. Dick, would you, would you mind grabbing that for me? <laughs> if you don't hold tightly, you, you drop both love and truth. Actually, that's going to be one of your fill in the blanks in just a minute here. So, so what happens is if you tend to extend love, you're just a really gracious person and you're full of mercy and you just love people and you have no trouble loving people who are really nasty servants, you know, we tend to just kind of get out of balance, Right? And then there are others of us who just maybe you have kind of more of a prophetic personality. You don't have any problem speaking truth and, and proclaiming what God's word has said, but you have a little bit of a hard time loving people. You, then you get out of balance this way. Really the picture here for this church, and he, he said it in Ephesus, you work hard, you, t- you don't tolerate evil, but you have a problem with love. You've lost your first love. In this particular church, they did things loving, but they they were losing some of the truth. So God's plan for spiritual maturity is that we hang on to both of these things. Now, I'm going to take this one step further. There are certain people in my life, and I'm going to guess in your life, you have no problem loving. They're just lovable. And so you can love them and love them and love them, but sometimes you have a hard time saying the hard things to them when you find them maybe have drifted away from some of God's biblical truths. There might be other people that are not so lovable that you have no problem speaking truth to them, right? But 
you know, a little harder time loving them. So here's the goal as a Christ follower, and here's a goal for our church here today. We want to be in loving in an extravagant way. And I mean those of you who are watching online too. Just because you're at home doesn't mean you get, get off of not loving. We want to love in an extravagant way, but we also want to hold tightly and proclaim the truth of God's word with boldness and unapologetically. Amen? That's what you're going to hear at this church, Lord willing, every single time when you come. I'm going to leave this right up here so you don't forget. All right. Now, we've been talking about this church that seemed to be loving and working hard, but they were having a problem with proclaiming the truth. Number seven, now we're going to get into this portion. Here's the admonition to this church, the correction. It says, you allow, is a fill in the blank, that's a big important word. You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants. Now, most likely, this was not actually a woman named Jezebel. I mean, there's a chance, right? Uh, that wasn't a popular name, nor is it today, really, because it has some bad connotations to it. And if you go back, and I won't take time today, but read First Kings chapter 20, I think, um, you will learn some things about this woman, Jezebel. She was, she was not a good. She, she enticed uh, the nation of Israel into idolatry. She killed the servants of God. She was uh, a really ho- a horrible person. And I believe, and most people agree, that it was more the spirit of this that he was drawing attention to rather than maybe a specific person, although it seems as though in this particular case, this was a woman who was a prophetess who was teaching that maybe had that kind of flavor or spiritual uh, um, sense of Jezebel who was enticing people into idolatry and certainly into immoral situations. She was teaching them this. Now, it's quite possible that she was a part of one of these guilds and yet was a part of the church. And the key word here is, and the correction to this church is, you allowed this to go on. Now, we know from Paul's writings and from the book of Acts that it had been communicated crystal clear. In fact, let's look at that in Acts chapter 15, I'll just have it up on the screen, I think, there. When Paul came back from one of his missionaries' journeys and the Gentiles had been coming to Christ in amazing numbers, they, they were left with this quandary, what shall we do? These aren't Jewish people. Should they have to follow the law? And the council in Jerusalem that was Peter and James and the apostles got together, they prayed, they sought the Lord, and they go, okay, we're not going to hold the, the Gentiles to following the law of Moses, but here's the things that they must do to be Christ followers. You, uh, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood and things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. So just four commendations there. The the Gentile church, so it was crystal clear that things sacrificed to idols and and sexual immorality is not okay in God's kingdom. And they spoke directly uh, to that. We find this church here that was allowing this woman to do that. And the two things we already spoke to them, spoke about them, was they, they were committing, she was committing sexual immorality and specifically named in this letter, was um, encouraging them to eat things or participate, really, in idol worship. Warren Wiersbe, who is Karen and my favorite Bible commentator, says the two great enemies to the New Testament church are these two things, sexual immorality and idolatry. And when I talk about idolatry, I'm not talking about, you know, worshiping in front of a golden calf. Uh, Pastor Gabe mentioned this last week. Idolatry is putting anything anything in our lives above God or in priority above, for, for above him. Anything. I mean, all kinds of things can be idolatry. Our work, success, money, recreation, our children, our husbands, relationships. Anything can get itself into a place above God in our lives, and that's what idolatry is. Number eight, The key ingredient to each of these areas or or overcoming each of these areas is faithfulness. And I want to think about that word just for a minute, folks. Faithfulness. The first part of that word is faithful, right? Or faith. It's a belief and a trust in God. 
And you know, as you look through the scriptures, and we just finished this long study of the book of Luke, over and over and over and over again, the one thing that Jesus always commended was faithfulness in his servants. Lack of faithfulness in your marriage ends up getting a person into immorality. Lack of faithfulness in your relationship with God ends you, ends you up in idolatry. Faithfulness is the, the, the call, I think, to God's people to be faithful in the things. In fact, we're going to see that unfold as we go. You know, both of these areas of faithfulness have to do with a covenant relationship. I, I've had the great joy and delight of marrying many, many couples And I always tell them the same thing, you know. This is a covenant you're entering into before God. It doesn't get any more serious than this on this earth. When you stand before God and say, I promise to love, honor, and cherish you until, and to be faithful only to you until death do us part. You're making a covenant to your spouse, but you're really making it to God that you're going to be faithful. And our relationship with Christ should have that same kind of covenant feeling is that you're saying to him, I'm going to be faithful to you, Lord, until the end of time, until I breathe my last, I'm going to be faithful to you. And one of the things I've learned about faithfulness, I tell couples this in pre-marriage counseling, you make that decision before the test comes. You make the decision to be faithful. When Karen and I stood uh, together 41 years ago, coming up here in a couple of weeks, And we said, I'm going to be faithful to you. We made a decision at that point to never be unfaithful, to stay connected, stay committed to one another. You've got to make that decision beforehand. And you have to make that decision with Christ as well, to be faithful to him no matter what comes, no matter how difficult. Now, this next portion is really interesting. I find this very interesting, and it's a glimpse into the heart of God. One of the reasons why we study the Bible is it reflects to us who God is. And my job, you should pray for me every day, because my job is to try to do the best thing I can, is to accurately represent God's heart to you. And yeah, I'm just like you. I'm a sinful human, and I really pray the Lord will help me do that. Here's the heart of God. He said about this woman, Jezebel, who had seduced the servants of Christ in the command adultery, he said to her, even to her, I gave her time to repent. Now, I think, just, would you just take that line and just recognize how loving and how kind is and what God's heart is to those of us who have gone astray. And this woman not only went way astray, but she was taking other Christians with her. Even this woman, Jesus says, I gave her time to repent. And folks, hear this message today. That is the heart of God. We know this about our human nature. We have a sin nature. And Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone each one to his own way. Jesus is calling Genesis to Revelation. He's calling us back to turn from sin and to be faithful to him and him alone. And when we have gone astray, he is so patient He gives us time. Even Jezebel, even this horrific sin that she was involved in, and again, not only the act, but then teaching other people out here, I gave her time. Now, we don't know how much time it was, but there was a set period of time that she had that she could repent. We see that throughout the history of Israel. God would call out to his people, return to me, turn away from your idolatry. And he always gave them a set time. But folks, don't miss this. There is a time, there is a moment when that time comes to an end. And Jesus has given us plenty of time and that time comes to an end and then judgment and punishment will surely come just like it did with this woman Jezebel. He is patient. He attempts in so many ways to give us the message of love and return to me, turn away from your sin and return to me. But there is a time, and when that time ends, judgment comes suddenly. We see it historically. Now, I wrote this scripture out here on on the end of that that can kind of explain one of our problems here. Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes 8.11, because a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, 
we've gone astray, we're in a sinful situation of some kind in our lives, and because judgment hasn't come quickly, we go, well, I guess I've kind of gotten away with it, you know? And maybe God didn't see it. Maybe he's going to ignore it this particular time and let me off the hook. Now, Jesus is full of grace and truth. He is loving. That's why he came and died on the cross to forgive us for our sins. But we are still called to account for our sinful life. And we see some, we see that the judgment came upon this woman, Jezebel. Now, you might be here today and God might be, have, might have been speaking to you about some areas in your life. You know it, that he has called you to repentance. And you might be in that time that he's allowed. Can I please share with you as your pastor and someone who loves you dearly, repent today. If you're involved in any kind of a sexual immoral relationship, if you're involved in idolatry, if you're allowing unforgiveness to be, remain in your heart towards somebody or bitterness or pride or self-righteousness or arrogance, whatever the sin, if God has been convicting you of this and you're in that time frame, let me just say to you, please, on behalf of the Lord, repent. Confess your sin to somebody today before you leave this place. And Confess to them that you, what you've been doing and ask them to pray for you and turn away from your sin because I'm telling you, when judgment comes, it comes swiftly. That's not my heart, that's God's heart. He loves us. And in this woman's case, number 10, Jezebel's sin, Jezebel's bed of sin would become her bed of sickness. And he says to this in verse um, 22, indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent from their deeds. The word sick bed, you can see there, to kill with death means to kill with pestilence. Now, I'm not exact, we don't know exactly what that means, but pestilence, let's just say that's not a good thing, right? You don't want to be in bed with pestilence. And again, I think the heart of God is that she even then would repent. We have this story in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when Paul writes him in, into the Corinthian church and he goes, I, I, it's said among you that you allow immorality not even like the Gentiles do because you have a man who's living with his mother's or his father's wife. He said, turn that guy over to Satan so that his body will be destroyed, but his spirit might be saved. The heart of this and the hope is that even in this torment, even in this trial, even in this attack of sickness, that he might turn and repent for his sins. You know, whenever there is a Jezebel, someone who is leading the way and enticing people into sin, it's been said that there's always an Ahab. And if you go back and read this story, you see Jezebel was kind of the lead in enticing Israel into idolatry, but her husband Ahab, he was the king of Israel. He should have known. He should have stood up and said, no, we will not do this. But he was weak and he just went right along with it. There's a call to repentance here, folks. Number 11, Jesus also brings great tribulation. That's what he said in this verse here. Uh, that means, the word means pressure on her children unless they repent of their deeds. Now, again, this church is about 40 years old and it seems as though that not only had Jezebel not only had they allowed the sexual immorality in the church, but she had been teaching this, and now she has followers. She has other children who she has taught this way of sin. And Jesus doesn't mince any words here that he will bring judgment upon this sin after there has been time for repentance. Number 12, the purpose for this punishment is for the churches to know. And the scripture tells us why God brought this punishment very publicly to these people. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And folks, don't, don't um, deceive yourself. The wages of sin is always death in our lives. So that all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I'll give to each one according to his works. So why did God publicly bring judgment upon these because number one, he, Jesus wants everyone to know. Remember the laser eyes? Jesus, the message to this church is from Jesus, I see and I know everything. I see through, into your minds, I see into your heart, I know every single thing that's going on 
inside of you. And I'm going to give each one, letter B, I'm going to give each one according to your works. Now, this is slightly different than the salvation issue, right? We accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we are redeemed and justified by him and him alone. And our entrance into heaven is based on what Christ did, not on our works. However, we are held to account about how we live our lives. 1 Corinthians 3 said, you know, there's no other foundation I can lay but Jesus Christ, and everyone builds on that foundation. You can use wood, hay, and stubble, which is going to burn up in the fire, or you can use gold, silver, and precious stones, and those things will remain forever. So there is a calling to account for how we live our lives as Christ followers. Yes, we receive salvation through Christ's death on the cross, but we are held to account for our lives and rewards will be handed out according to how we chose to live, to live our lives. Jesus will give each one according to their works. The exhortation of this church is to hold fast, he says, until I come. Jesus, he says in verse 24, he says, not all of you have fallen into this doctrine. In the church, there are many of you who have held fast, but somewhere along the line, and I, I think this letter was really addressed to the leadership of that church that had allowed this, but he said, there are many of you here, you have not given into that. Good for you. You haven't fallen into the depths of Satan. Way to go. And he goes on to say in verse 25, hold fast to what you have until I come. Hold fast. Now, let's face it. This life here on this earth is for, full of turmoil. Would you agree with that? But we've been given a rock, we've been given an anchor, we have been given a rope that will never fail us in Christ. And how do we get from here into eternity is we hold fast to what we have. You take the word of God and you hold it tightly to your life. You hold fast. You trust God for help and strength to hold fast to the things that he's given us. You hold fast to the teaching that we, we receive from the scripture to be faithful to him, to worship him, to honor him, to serve him as we should, and to put aside and put away evil and call it to account to speak truth when there is sin in our lives and the lives of other people. Hold fast, hold tight. It means to hold tightly, carefully, and faithfully until Jesus comes back. I was thinking about the picture. You know, if you were being rescued, if you had fallen into a, you know, turmoil, a sea of turmoil or something like that, you see this on the TV all the time, and the helicopter comes and they let down the rope, you know, and you put the thing about you, you know, I'm just going to guess that most of us would grab a hold of that rope for all of our strength and hold on when we, as we're being lifted out of sure, certain death and danger. It's kind of the same picture. Jesus has extended us a rope of, of safety and we have this wonderful relationship with him, and we better grab hold of that and hold on tight because the ride might be bumpy from here on out. He also says, keep my works until the end. We're not just to hold on until Jesus comes. We have work to do here on this earth to proclaim who Christ is and proclaim his love to so many. And then he gives a wonderful promise to the overcomers. And the, number 15, the, the overcomers are the ones who are victorious that have, have repented for their sinfulness, have turned away from God and are holding fast to the word of God. Now, do we do this perfectly? Of course not, right? But let's not use that as an excuse to justify sinful behavior. All of us are sinners saved by grace. But so often we use that grace as an excuse not to deal with the stuff in our lives. He gives two promises. Letter A, he said, you'll have authority over the nation. And uh, John here, or G actually Jesus, as he's dictating this letter to John, he quotes uh, Psalms 2. And Psalms 2 is all about the authority that God is going to give his son at the end of time. When Jesus is, comes back and he is reinstated here and he has a thousand years of reign here on this earth, and there's an invitation for Christ's followers that we're going to reign with him. Now, I think this must have been especially meaningful to this church who had the authority of Rome over them, who had this uh, horrible temple of Apollos that was ruling over the community there, who had these trade guilds that were, you know, demanding stuff of their lives. They must have felt like we're the lowest person on the totem pole here. And Jesus is saying to them, hang on, hold fast. I'm going to come back and you're the ones who are going to be in authority when I return and reign. And then he leaves them one with this beautiful, beautiful picture. He also says, and I'll read this, 
Um, verse 28 says, I will give him the morning star. Now, this is a name for Jesus. In fact, I have written on your notes there, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16 says, I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Now, this is such a beautiful promise, and the fill in the blank is the, the, the promise is the hope that comes from relationship in Christ. You know, I got up on Friday. I had plans to meet a friend of mine to go fishing. And so I left the house about 4.20 in the morning. And I walked out, and the sky was so beautiful, and I could just barely see a little hint of light way off in the distance. And here was this crescent moon and the bright and morning star shining so brightly. It's the brightest star of the morning. And the bright and morning star is a picture of the hope that is coming in Christ. It is, it's the promise that dawn is just about ready to come. To hang on. You know, I don't know if you've ever spent a cold night out in the wilderness. I've done that many, many times. And it's cold and it's dark and you're freezing and you're ready to, you know, hope and pray and waiting for that sun to arise. And the, the bright morning star is a, is a promise of the coming dawn when the warmth of the S-O-N will reach us. And folks, according to this Bible, that time is coming. When Jesus is going to return and judgment will be executed on all those who have not received him and turned away from him. There's a promise of the coming Savior, and I'm really looking forward to that day. Right now, we have the bright morning star, and that was the promise to this church. Deal with the sinful stuff. You've been allowing these things in your midst. Speak up. Address it. Talk to it. Make sure that people are called to account. Don't allow that kind of sinfulness in the church. And folks, this is in our day and age in America here. I think this letter more than maybe any of the others describes the church in America here. Remember the two great enemies of the church in America, sexual immorality and idolatry. And this isn't a letter to the evil people out there. It's to the church. We need to repent, turn from our wicked ways, turn from our idolatry, and give ourselves wholly and fully to Christ. He's calling this church to repentance. He's calling his people to repentance. And I'm telling you right now, there is something that is just beginning to stir in our nation. This is like the very first signs, I believe, of something special that is coming. There's a, a prophet in America. Some of you have read the book, The Harbinger. Jonathan Kahn, and he's very well respected among well-known Christians um, in our land, and he is calling our country to a time of repentance. I want to show you a video here, and then I'll share a few thoughts about this call right now to repentance. This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a pivotal moment in American history and world history. A moment that can permanently seal our nation's course and the course of the world for good, for bad, for calamity, for redemption. America and much of Western civilization was founded on a biblical foundation stone, but it's turned away from that foundation. We have not only driven God out of our public life, and have called what is good evil and what is sin good. But we have sacrificed the lives of over 60 million unborn children. And America's fall from God is not only progressing, it's accelerating to the point that it's no longer just a falling away, but a war against the purposes of God. I wrote in the harbinger of the signs of judgment that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel, warning of calamity that these same signs of warning have now appeared on American soil. The biblical template concerning judgment is that the nation so warned is given a space of time to return or to head for judgment and calamity. We are now in that window of time. 
But if America continues on its present course, that window will come to an end, and there will come a flood that will begin the end of religious freedom, even usher in persecution, and seal America's fall. And if America falls, it will affect the entire world. This year, 2020, is crucial as it leads to a presidential election in which the stakes are higher and the necessity of prayer more critical than ever before. And even if the election goes in the direction of biblical values and righteousness, if we don't see a spiritual turning, an awakening, a repentance, revival, then all the political, legal, judicial, and cultural efforts will ultimately fail or be undone. We have a window of time, and the purpose of that window is to return and for revival. Without that return, America will be lost. What can we do? What can you do? In the days following 9-11, people flocked to houses of worship, and it looked as if there could have been a spiritual revival, an awakening. But it never came, because there was no repentance. And without repentance, without a turning back, there can be no revival. But I have seen, once in my life, the hand of God change the course of American and world history. And it all began, not in the halls of government, but with the people of God who gathered in a sacred assembly in our nation's capital with the scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sinful ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It can happen again. But if we don't respond now, at this most critical moment, we may never have the chance to do so again. Since the time of 9-11, I've been calling for return, for repentance, for revival, not only as individuals, but as a nation, according to 2 Chronicles 714. At the same time, a faithful man of God, Kevin Jessup, has for years carried the burden of a sacred assembly for that same purpose of restoration. We are convicted that now is the time. Therefore, this is the announcing of the return, the national and global day of prayer and repentance. It will be a day and more than a day, a time and a season for the movement for prayer, repentance, return, and revival. The central day will be Saturday, September 26th, in a sacred assembly, according to what is laid forth in Scripture, to take place in our nation's capital on the Washington Mall. For those who can't make it, or want to do something where you are, then gather together in your states, your cities, in your towns, in your houses of worship, in your homes, or be part of those gatherings already planned. This will take place not only 40 days before the presidential election, but also on the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower in the days of America's founding and dedication to God. And surrounding the day of return on September 26th will be 10 days known from ancient times as the 10 days of repentance, starting with the Feast of Trumpets and ending on the Day of Atonement to set as a special time to intensify our prayers, our intercessions for repentance and revival. September 18th to September 28th. Believers and leaders who are already part of the return include everybody from Pat Robertson to Dr. James Dobson, from Billy Graham's daughter Anne Graham Lotz to Martin Luther King's niece Alveda King and many, many more. When does the return begin? Right now. How? With you and me as we commit this time and this year for return, prayer, repentance, and revival. To commit first to our own repentance and to begin actually living in revival. And then to pray for others, the return and revival of our nation and the world. You who are parents, begin by leading your families in revival. Ministers, lead your groups in revival. Pastors, lead your churches into revival. Leaders of ministries, movements, and denominations, lead your people into revival. And spread the word to everybody you can. Let the believers, pastors, and churches in your areas know. Use social media, use everything you can to spread the word so they can have a part. And if you're watching this and you're not sure you know God, or that your life is in His will, then come to Him now. Or come back to Him now. 
and then come join in in the return. So I invite you to come to the nation's capital on the Washington Mall, September 26th, 2020. Plan now. You can rent buses, trains, cars, planes, however you can come or gather wherever you are. And if you're watching this from a nation outside of America, you can be part of bringing the return to your nation by doing what I've set forth in this message and going to the return website for more information. I'll be sending out more messages as we go forth. But for now, for more information, to have a greater part to represent the return in your area or to stay up to date, if you're not already on that site, go to the website for the return, which is easy to remember. It's thereturnwebsite.org. That's thereturnwebsite.org. The Lord is calling. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sinful ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The movement and chance we have before us now may never come again. If we don't return now, we may pass the point of no return. So now, in view of the calling and of the moment before us, let us each rise to that call to do what he has called us to do, to believe for great and mighty things we know not of, to return and seek to live in revival and become messengers of revival. It's time to break up our fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord as never before. It's time to return. Share with Pastor Scott and I about three weeks ago, and I think both of us had just captured our heart and said, yes, Lord, this is your call to us. So I'm very pleased to... Um, let you guys know that we're the first church that has signed on to uh, participate and make this happen. And God has been really doing some miraculous things. He has provided for us the state line speedway, which you can almost see when you walk out back. Maybe you can when you walk out our doors. It's right that direction. So on September 26th, and we're going to do it from 11 to 1, so it will coincide to the hours that this takes place in Washington, D.C. And we hope that a million show up there. And we hope this entire valley turns out at the Speedway on September 26th for a time of worship, of just some brief instruction in the Word, and more than anything else, a time of repentance and prayer for our, our nation. I don't know if you caught that. He said, there is America right now, we have a window of time. And we saw that so clearly in this text today. Jezebel was given a window of time in which to repent. And the call here, as it was in this book, are to Christians. That wonderful passage, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land and forgive their sins. This is God's call to the church. So I have already committed you. I hope you're in on this. And we're going to need an army of help in things like counseling for people who come forward in response and need prayer, in things like cleanup committees and parking detail and security detail and all those kinds of things. And I'm trusting and hoping that you guys will stand up. I, we have no idea who will come. I've already been spreading the word to some of my friends who have pastors, both in Coeur d'Alene and also in Spokane. And everyone I've talked to so far has been positive, And they said, yes, we want to participate in this. We want to come. My prayer is that we fill that speedway to overflowing. And we're excited. Our worship team is going to be leading worship there that day. And it's going to be an incredible time of repentance. It's a called repentance. And as, as he mentioned, as Jonathan Kahn mentioned, there's a 10-day period. And we're going to be having things going on here at the church during that 10-day period for us to just come and pray, seek his face. But folks, the call to the church is to turn from our sinful ways. Our, so much of our focus is out there, and we need to start. The word of God is really clear. Judgment starts at the house of God. For those of us who know Christ as our Lord and Savior, repentance starts here. Now, I don't know if you've been hearing these little reports, but there is a stirring that is happening in our nation already. God is doing something. 
There was a report in, from Huntington Beach just about two weeks ago. They closed the churches and said, you guys can't meet because of the COVID thing. They went out onto the beach. And there's, you look it up, Huntington Beach Revival. People are coming. They're falling on their faces before the Lord, repenting. They're baptizing them right there in the ocean. It happened last week in Portland, when, uh, just very close to where the riots are taking place. Somebody uh, full of faith came and started playing worship music, and people are coming to Christ. They're baptizing them right in the river right there. In Seattle, someone told me it happened this week as well. Something is beginning to stir. I don't want to miss it. How about you? So let's do what and, and respond to this call. As, as Jonathan read, those, you know, some of our, our nation leaders and spiritual fathers and mothers in this land, you know, like Lam, uh, what's her name? Am Grand Lots, thank you. And Dr. Dobson and others have already signed on and said, yes, we need to repent as a church, let's come together. So please, please be praying. We need, we need war, prayer warriors to be lifting this up. Put that on your note. Make a note on your refrigerator and begin praying. And we're going to do this together as a church. Amen. Do I have your support in this? Yes. Praise the Lord. Good. So let's return to the Lord and let's start today, okay? So again, as I shared, if you have something that you need to repent of today, there'll be somebody right up front. Be glad to pray for you. Find a trusted friend confession is very important that we confess our sins one to another scripture really clear on that and ask for prayer let's do it together let's do it together amen god bless you thanks for coming may the lord bless you and keep you may his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you may he lift up his countenance upon you today and give you his peace be blessed in christ thanks so much for coming we'll see you again soon we'll have signups next week for you on where you might want to serve on the return